Good afternoon. This is Stephanie Anderson. I am a certified wealth strategist here at Pulse Financial Services, and we're happy to welcome you to the economic and market update for the fourth quarter of 2024. The U.S. economy appears to have maintained a solid growth pace over the summer, fueled by resilient consumer spending. At the same time, inflation continued on a path back toward the Federal Reserve's 2% target, while a rising unemployment rate sparked fears the labor market is cooling too quickly. Moving forward, resilient consumer spending should support trend-like economic growth into 2025, and with few exceptions, building across the cyclical sectors of the economy, a near-term recession seems unlikely. Meanwhile, cooling inflation has allowed the Federal Reserve to put more focus on the labor market, prompting it to join other global central banks in easing policy and deliver a 50 basis point rate cut in September. While the Fed's updated economic projections forecast two more rate cuts this year, the pace of cuts will depend heavily on the incoming data. It does appear, however, that rates will settle in at structurally higher level relative to the past decade, barring any economic shocks. For markets, this summer was anything but calm. Equity market volatility spiked in August due to lackluster guidance from the Magni Magnificent Seven, weaker economic data, and policy action from the Bank of Japan. However, market jitters have faded in recent weeks with broadening earnings growth and a rate cut bet, bets pushing markets higher and leaving valuations elevated. Expectations for dovish policy action have helped bonds rally too, and yields are lower now than at the start of the year. With the U.S. election quickly approaching, geopolitical tensions still are still elevated and the Federal Reserve keen on normalizing policy without sending gloomy signals risks remain that could keep markets volatile and tip the U.S. into recession. Against this backdrop, investors may want to lean into active managers to, ex to access attractive opportunities in an environment of rich index level valuations while diversifying across global stocks, bonds, and alternatives. The Guide to the Markets, now in its 20th year, is built to illustrate economic fundamentals and investment opportunities and risks. There are still 60 or there are over 60 pages in the guide, but we've boiled it down to just 10 slides. In particular, we assess the recent performance of the market and economy, considering trends in growth, jobs and inflation in the US, and how these trends are shaping the outlook for monetary policy. This is followed by comments on growth from around the globe, and finally, a discussion of the global opportunity set across stocks, bonds, and alternative assets. After a sluggish start to the new year, the U.S. economy accelerated during the second quarter, growing at a 3% annualized pace. While inventory accumulation was a large contributor, underlying demand was robust and consumer spending rising an impressive 2.8%. However, other economic data ranging from PMIs to employment indicators have begun to slow, sparking fears that the economy may be closing in on a recession. However, with few exceptions building across the cyclical sectors of the economy, a recession seems unlikely. Page 18 of the guide is designed to assess the health of the economy by looking at key cyclical sectors, including residential investment, business fixed investment, light vehicle sales, and the business inventory to sales ratio. We often refer to this slide as the four horsemen of a recession because across these cyclical economic sectors, there is usually one or more that becomes overextended, suggesting that a bubble, which could pre precipitate a recession, is forming. Currently, none of these sectors look overextended. Residential investment and vehicle sales are near average levels, signaling that excessive home building is not an issue and consumers are in decent shape. Moreover, business spending is still in check, even with recent AI enthusiasm, and businesses are not accumulating excessive amounts of inventory. Overall, none of these cyclical sectors look overextended now, suggesting the risk of some endogenous shock-inducing shock inducing a recession is low. That said, with the U.S. election just over a month away, monetary policy at a critical turning point and geopolitical tensions still elevated, external risks remain that could tip the U.S. into a recession, albeit a mild one. 
Coming out of the pandemic, strong demand for labor clashed with a limited supply of workers, creating one of the tightest labor markets ever seen. However, page 26 of the guide shows that labor demand has largely nom normalized from its post-pandemic boom. One way to gauge labor demand is by examining job openings measured in the JOLTS report. After peaking at 12.2 million in March of 2022, job openings have steadily fallen over the past two years with just 7.7 .7 million job openings reported in July of 2024. This print lowered the ratio of job openings per unemployed worker to 1.07 times, well below 2019 levels. Quits have normalized also as loosening labor market conditions have made employees more wary about leaving their current posts. That said, other data, while softening, suggests the labor market is still on solid footing. Layoffs remain historically low, while initial, initial claims for unemployment benefits have settled down after disruptive weather conditions and larger-than-expected auto plant shutdowns caused them to spike this summer. In fact, they are lower than they have been in more than 80% of the time in this century. While labor demand has normalized, it hasn't deteriorated to the point of concern. Job openings are still higher than in any month prior to the pandemic, and subdued layoffs indicate that businesses have enough confidence in their current prospects to retain their workforce. Overall, while certainly softer than it was relative to the past two years, the labor market still looks healthy and resilient economic growth in the coming quarters should facilitate plenty of hiring. Within the broader labor market mosaic, investors have found themselves paying particular attention to one measure, the unemployment rate. After reaching a cycle low of 3.4% in April 2023, Unemployment has steadily ticked higher, reaching 4.3% in July before easing slightly to 4.2% in August. While this is still lower than it has been almost 88% of the time over the last 50 years, the July jobs report spooked investors. With unemployment jumping to 4.3%, this report triggered the SOM rule, which states that if the unemployment rate's three-month moving average exceeds its prior 12-month low, by 0.5%, a recession might already be underway. An increase in unemployment due to layoffs would indeed be concerning. However, with layoffs and initial jobless claims still historically low, this hasn't been the case thus far. Instead, the trend higher in the unemployment rate likely reflects a healthy normalization of the labor market that was operating above full employment as opposed to something more sinister. Nonetheless, Loosening labor market slack has also led to a moderation in wage growth. After peaking at 7% in March of 2022, growth has continued to slow back to trend. Wages rose 4.1% year over year in August, just above the 50-year average of 3.9%. While this is likely slightly above what is cons consistent with the Federal Reserve's 2% inflation target, Softening labor market conditions should help wage growth ease, bringing inflation down with it. After a bumpy start to the year, inflation has made meaningful progress lower in recent months, giving the Federal Reserve greater confidence that it is on a sustainable path back to 2%. Disinflationary tailwinds remained intact during the third quarter, with headline CPI inflation falling to 2.5% year-over-year in August, its lowest print since early 2021. Core good prices have trended lower for six consecutive months as supply chains have remained well-managed, even with elevated geopolitical tensions, and should remain well-behaved. On the more volatile components, lower gasoline prices throughout the summer have weighed on energy prices, while food inflation has remained mild. Moving forward, sluggish global demand limits the, like, limits the likelihood of a surge in either of these categories. That brings us to the stickier segments of inflation, shelter, and auto insurance. Shelter inflation accounts for over one-third of the CPI basket and is held stubbornly above its pre-pandemic trend. That said, real-time measures of market rent point more to point to more normal levels of shelter inflation ahead. Auto insurance, a consistent hotspot of inflation, has eased slightly in recent months, 
but it's still rising by over 16% year over year. Fortunately, as the rollover in vehicle prices feed through the data, this trend should lower, or this trend lower should continue. Overall, inflation should continue to ease into 2025, while price gains in shelter and auto insurance remain elevated, real-time data continue to point to easing price pressures ahead. And with broader disinflationary tailwinds, such as easing wage pressures and stable supply chains, with inflation on a steady path back to 2%, the Federal Reserve has turned its focus to the employment side of its dual mandate. At the Jackson Hole Economic Symposium, Chair Powell noted the committee does not seek or welcome further cooling in the labor market conditions, opening the door for the Fed to join other global central banks' easing policy. At its highly anticipated September meeting, the Federal Reserve opted to kick off its rate cutting cycle with a 50 basis point cut, reducing the federal funds rate to a range of 4.75 to 5%. Although some may see the larger move as a sign of, Fed, of the Fed's concern about the economy, its updated economic projections still predict a soft landing. Over the next four years, the committee expects steady growth of 2%, and while unemployment rate forecasts rose by 40 basis points and 20 basis points for 2024 and 2025 respectively, inflation forecasts for the same periods move lower. With an eye on the labor market, the Fed pulled forward rate cuts in, an, uh, in its updated dot plot, penciling in two more rate cuts for this year, but still four cuts in 2025, while the neutral federal funds rate ticked higher to 2.9%. Today, market expectations are more dovish compared to the Fed's forecast and interest rates could rise modestly from here should some rate cut fails, cuts fail to materialize. Nonetheless, the long-awaited rate-cutting cycle is finally here, and while the pace of cuts hinges on the incoming data, interest rates should settle at the structurally higher level compared to the last decade, barring any economic shocks. Bonds rallied over 5% as cooling economic data and dovish Fed commentary caused markets to double down on rate-cut bets. Even after this rally, yields across many fixed income sectors still look attractive relative to recent history. Slide 39 shows yields across fixed income sectors relative to the last 10 years, and nearly all sectors are trading above their 10-year median yields. Simply sticking with core fixed income provides attractive yields of almost 5%, while leaning into riskier asset classes like high yield can provide yields of about 7%. Credit spreads across investment grade and high yield do look tight. However, corporate fundamentals are still in solid shape and in a trend-like growth environment, spreads can remain tight. All to say, tighter spreads shouldn't deter investors from taking advantage of attractive all-in yields. While it's difficult to make an any outsized bet on duration after the recent rally, bonds should help diversify portfolios if lower rates coincide with recession. Moreover, even if rates hold steady, bonds can generate strong returns via attractive coupons, and current yields still offer an attractive yield cushion that can help offset losses if rates move higher. As the Federal Reserve moves deeper into its rate-cutting cycle, the potential for asymmetric returns in bonds may fade, underscoring the importance of locking in attractive levels of income while they're still here. The global economy has held up better than expected despite some pockets of weakness. The US and emerging markets, excluding China, have shown robust growth while Europe, given its manufacturing-centric economy, may continue to face challenges. The manufacturing sector in Germany, Europe's largest economy, is facing structural issues as policies are driving up energy costs and competition from other vehicle makers. However, strength in the service-oriented economies of Southern Europe, including Italy and Spain, is partially offsetting this manufacturing weakness. Moving forward, rate cuts from the European Central Bank could alleviate pressure on both business and personal lending, helping to spur activity. In China, the real estate slump continues to hamper growth, Inflation remains near zero and domestic demand remains suppressed. 
However, stimulative policies and government intervention could improve sentiment and stabilize growth around the government's 5% target. Elsewhere in Asia, Taiwan, and Korea have benefited from renewed momentum in the electronic sector, while favorably favorable demographics and business policies are expected to sustain India's growth trajectory. Overall, this year is poised to be a solid one for the global economy, which has thus far managed to avoid a recession. As global central banks continue to normalize policy and inflation gradually returns to more manageable levels without a meaningful show shutdown, slowdown in economic activity, global risk assets should continue to trend higher. A long cycle of U.S. equity markets, market outperformance over international markets has left many U.S.-based investors nervous about allocating abroad. While U.S. equity performance has been impressive, it has also driven U.S. concentration in global equity indices to an unprecedented high of 64%. This heavy concentration exposes passive investors to risks specific to U.S. markets, including elevated equity valuations. In contrast, valuations in most other major markets are in line with or below their 25-year average, with the notable exceptions being the U.S. and India. Enthusiasm for these markets, coupled with robust earnings growth, has resulted in their higher valuations relative to peers. India has experienced over 6% annual economic growth over the past three fiscal years, fueled by strong investment in domestic consumption. Elsewhere, there is significant potential for earnings growth to accelerate. Japan stands out, especially with the return of inflation leading to higher nominal growth, creating a favorable environment for stronger corporate earnings. Additionally, Japan's ongoing focus on, improve, on improving corporate governance could drive further multiple expansion. Emerging markets, including, excluding China, Taiwan, and Korea, are witnessing sharp earnings rebounds as the tech cycle gains momentum. In aggregate, international equities present attractive discounts and higher dividend yields compared to their U.S. counterparts. In fact, international equity valuations are trading more than two standard deviations below those in the U.S., not only that, but international stocks also offer 170 basis points of more income. With interest rates likely to settle at a structurally higher level compared to the last decade, there is increased potential for international markets to outperform given their higher exposure to value-oriented sectors. Moreover, with favorable valuations and a range of fundamental tailwinds emerging across markets, investors should find plenty of attractive opportunities abroad. As stocks climbed higher and bond yields fell during the third quarter, the, challenge, the challenges facing the traditional 60-40 portfolio became even more pronounced. Stocks and bonds remain positively correlated and continue to offer mediocre levels of income. Moreover, elevated equity valuations and low bond yields relative to history point to less impressive returns from the 60-40 moving forward. Against this backdrop, investors may have to look elsewhere for consistent outcomes across alpha, income, and diversification. Investors willing to venture outside of the public markets can leverage a range of different alternative assets to reach their desired outcomes. Indeed, as we show on slide 55 of the guide, alternative assets can offer low correlations to public markets, diversified income streams, and enhanced long-run returns. Real assets shown towards the left, such as real estate, infrastructure, and transport, tend to be less correlated to a traditional 60-40 portfolio while providing robust income. Private equity and venture capital towards the right could provide much higher total returns, but come with higher correlations to public markets and less income generation. The classic 60-40 stock bond portfolio still looks attractive, but adding a sleeve of alternatives can help long-term investors achieve strategic goals through higher alpha, better diversification, and enhanced income. Now I will go ahead and go through the necessary disclosures. 
And I will just go ahead and end by saying thank you for joining us. Hopefully you found this to be insightful. We are always here and happy to respond to any questions um, or weigh in on any ideas you have for your personal investment portfolio. And we hope you have a wonderful day and we'll catch you in January. Thank you so much and take care.